How's everyone doing? I, I always find it useful when I come to a public meeting and I learn something. I've learned tonight that Spencer doesn't like to manage consultants. I'm not, I'm not sure how to take that. So I'm going to let that go for now. Um, but part of, uh, part of our role in the team and, and our role here tonight is to help frame a little bit of the context around Spring Garden, what, why it matters. We've been doing some initial analysis as a team. We want to share some of that with you to get, to get kind of the ideas going in your head as well. This is all in process, but we want to frame some of that context. And I should say that um, for, for my firm, this is a very important project and something that's very personal to us. Our, our office is at 12th and Callow Hill, and I'd say the majority of my office walks on Spring Garden on any given day. So it's something that we're very, very close to and, and we've taken very seriously. So Spring Garden, as you all know, that's, uh, th there's your little context map, right? Edge to edge, river to river, neighborhood, uh, neighborhood to neighborhood. That is, uh, that is certainly the goal of the project. And one of the things that uh, is unique about this project is that it really is tapping into a very large regional and national trail network, and something that Patrick talked about when uh, he began this presentation and Spencer echoed as well. So it's an opportunity not just to connect locally, but also to connect beyond these neighborhoods. It's also a really distinctive street in Philadelphia. It's something that always strikes us about Spring Garden. There are so few streets in the city there is as wide as Spring Garden, where we have all of that space to work with, but also that connect the rivers, that have all of that transit connections, that connects neighborhoods, but there's also some existing vacancy. So part of the opportunity with this project is to use investment in improving the streets to also improve the storefronts and the neighborhoods that meet, the, that meet Spring Garden. So it's a, it's a great opportunity to see how investment can really make a difference and support the priorities that the communities have. Um, some of you may know this. There's a pretty strong historical legacy here with Spring Garden Street. Uh, it is wide, in fact, because it was once a green street uh, with a landscaped median. So there is a, a legacy that we're trying to build on and, and improve uh, and sort of bring up to speed with kind of our, our modern day expectations of how we use streets and how they operate in terms of managing stormwater and those other types of issues. Spring Garden Street is also a spine. Uh, it connects a lot of different assets, not just the rivers, but things like the Community College of Philadelphia, uh, job centers like the American Red Claw, uh, Cross and the Social Security Administration, there's the Edgar Allan Poe House. There's a lot of really unique things near Spring Garden that makes it uh, distinctive as well. But we have this street that now carries a fair amount of bicycle traffic already, and if you're on the street any day, you see a fair amount of bikes on Spring Garden. There's also a growing network of bicycles around Spring Garden, and there's a lot of pedestrians. Not everywhere on Spring Garden, but in certain locations it can get pretty mobbed. So we have a lot of people, we have a lot of bikes already using the street. We also have a lot of cars. So Sam Schwartz Engineering um, has been collecting a little bit of traffic data, looking at how many cars uh, are on Spring Garden in the AM and in the PM. Um, it's a lot of cars on Spring Garden, but the other thing that we also have been keeping in mind is that there are also cars on those north-south streets, 21st, 22nd, Broad, 11th, 12th, 5th, 6th, those pairs of streets carry a lot of traffic as well. And so when we start to think about the design of Spring Garden, we're going to have to look not just at Spring Garden, but at the intersections and how to manage traffic and make sure that everything is safe, not just for people on bicycles, but people driving and people walking. And I mentioned earlier that Spring Garden is a hub of transit connections. It uh, cuts across, I think, nine different bus lines, two subway lines, which makes it uh, a really convenient place to be if you're looking to catch public transit. And not surprisingly, if, if you look at um, the 43, which is the bus that goes up and down Spring Garden, we, uh, we looked at the ridership data, 2009, 2011, uh, and you see those big circles. That's where, the, where we had the most people getting on buses, catching the bus, or getting off the bus. You know, not surprisingly, it would probably ring true with your expectations of, of what you would think about Spring Garden. You have a lot of people getting on and off the bus at the Broad Street Line. It's a fair amount at, um, at the Market Frankfurt L um, over by 2nd Street, and there's a lot at the community college. So that's something that we'll be taking into account. Where is the bus getting the most use, and where is there people waiting for the bus? Because that becomes something that we have to think about when we're designing the street. The other thing that's interesting to note here, there are um, four little stars 
up there on the map. Those indicate bus shelters. Those are the only four bus shelters on Spring Garden. You know, they don't necessarily overlap with those places where people are catching the bus most frequently. So it's something we'll also be thinking about. So we have lots of cars, lots of people, lots of bicycles, lots of transit. Not surprisingly, you get all of that kind of activity on one street, there's going to be some conflicts. So the team has also been collecting some crash data. What this graph, um, graphic shows is uh, crashes between bicycle and automobiles, pedestrian automobiles, and bicycle uh, and pedestrians. And not surprisingly, uh, the total number of crashes kind of mirror those places where you see the most people. Broad Street, Community College, even a little bit by the Second, uh, uh, second Street and the, the uh, Market Frankfurt L. This is just total number of crashes. So we'll be looking at this data in a lot more detail to get a sense of what that really means in terms of, well, how, how does the total number of crashes relate to the amount of bicycles that are on the street or the total number uh, of cars on those streets, for instance? So it's part of the process that we have to go through to kind of understand what's happening on the ground. So kind of moving off of the, the subject of transportation for a second, uh, Spring Garden also, I mentioned it connects neighborhoods. And all of these different neighborhoods, Spring Garden, Logan Square, Northern Liberties, Cal Hill, Chinatown North, West Poplar, all of these different neighborhoods are very, very distinct. They have very different histories. They developed in different ways, which means they meet Spring Garden Street in very different ways. So there are times where Spring Garden feels really established, like it's part of a residential community. And there are other times where it feels kind of hip and active. There's commercial uses and you see people out at night. But then there are also times when Spring Garden feels a little empty and vacant. So we have these varying conditions as you move along Spring Garden from river to river. So we went out and took a look at all of the existing uses on Spring Garden. Walked up and down the street, looked at every building, looked at every parcel and tried to figure out, well, is it used? How is it used? Is it a church? Is it a schoolhouse, et cetera? Uh, what this map shows is basically a land use map, and all of those colors indicate a different type of use. And one of the interesting things about Spring Garden is that it's kind of equal mixture of a couple different things. You've got a lot of institutional uses, like schools, community college, um, even the American Red Cross, for instance. You have a lot of commercial uses. Some of those are commercial, like you might think of it, like a bar or a restaurant, and some of it is commercial that looks more like a warehouse, uh, uh, those kinds of things. We also have a fair amount of vacancy on the street. About 10% of the parcels on Spring Garden is vacant. The other thing to note on this, if you look kind of carefully at the, at the line of Spring Garden, you, if all of those colors on the bottom half of Spring Garden are really large. So even the development pattern of the street changes. You have lots of little properties smaller homes, smaller buildings. It's more in line with how we think of Philadelphia on the north edge of the street, particularly, wait, does this work? Yeah, particularly here, along this north edge. But the south side of the street was developed over time with much larger uses. So not only does Spring Garden change east to west, it changes from one side of the street to the next. But very broadly speaking, this is kind of our simplistic view. If we were to categorize Spring Garden into a couple sub-districts, it would start with a park over by the museum. You'd end up in a residential area. You have a primarily a number of educational facilities, including Masterman, uh, over to Broad. Then you get this odd area between Broad and about 9th or 10th, where there's a lot more vacancy. And I'll talk about that in a second. And then over closer to Northern Liberties um, and East Poplar, you've got some institutional uses, some commercial uses, so it really does change. That's kind of our simplistic view of sort of sub-districts within this street. Um, and there might be an opportunity to really try to call out the uniqueness of the street in the design of the street itself. So when we talk about vacancy, one thing we like to do is not just look at vacancy, but also how the street feels. Does, does it feel active? If we're trying to encourage people to walk along Spring Garden, does it feel active? Would it encourage them to do so? So we look not just at vacancy, where there's an empty building or an empty lot, but we also look at the location of parking lots or places where there's big blank walls. So any place that feels like it's just inactive, no one's, there's no eyes on the street. Um, and about 50% of Spring Garden has that kind of frontage. And you see it's largely sort of focused. This is, sorry. Uh, this is 12th Street right here. My office is right there. Um, so this is 12th Street, um, 10th. That area primarily is where you have a, a fair amount of that, what we call inactive frontage. So if you remember some of those areas, and then you look at that, 
and compare it to crime, we've been collecting some crime data from, from the City of Philadelphia Police Department. What this map shows are hot spots for crimes. This is crimes against property. And it's not terribly surprising that there's some overlap here in terms of where those inactive frontages are, where it seems to feel dead, particularly at night, and where you have some hot spots for crime. So here we are again at 10th and 11th. This is 5th and 6th, where there's a couple big blank walls related to some existing development that's been there for a while. So we're looking at crime patterns as well. Uh, I know it's, it's something that's come up in some of the meetings that PEC has had with community groups. It's crimes against property. We also looked at crimes against persons, which follows a little bit of a different pattern. Crimes against persons often gravitates towards where there's the most persons. Right? So Broad Street, for instance, uh, becomes one of those locations. Um, where there's a lot of people out on street, that's where you tend to see sort of increased uh, activity in terms of crime. And then we've also been looking as a team at some of the environmental aspects of, of Spring Garden. Uh, we did a tree survey, we wanted to take a, take a good look at all of the different trees on Spring Garden, because there are parts of Spring Garden that feels really lush um, and, and really beautiful to walk along, but there are lots of other parts that, as, as we've said, also kind of missing some trees. So when we cataloged all of it, uh, about 40% of Spring Garden have blocks with two trees or fewer. So again, as we start to think about what a greenway means, uh, in the context of Spring Garden, we have to think about the tree plantings, the landscaping, but also the things that help the street operate, like stormwater management. So those are all aspects of the project that we're charged with looking at and working with all of you to design in a way that, that meets the goals of, of each of the communities surrounding it. So this is kind of my summary slide before I pass it off to uh, Doug from Sam Schwartz. But I had mentioned a number of different things just in kind of setting the, the, the context uh, for Spring Garden and some of the things that we're learning by looking at the data. But it is an extremely wide street, which means we have a lot of room to play with. We also have a lot of constraints to deal with. We have traffic, we have to manage safety, we have to look at vacancy and how the street feels and manage things like stormwater. So those are all of the types of questions that we have and we hope that we'll be able to work with all of you to start to define some of those answers.